Hey everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the weekly live show, Lead Your Movement. I'm Angelique Rewers, CEO and founder of The Corporate Agent, and we are back after a two-week pseudo hiatus. Uh, for the last two weeks, we have been hosting our Lead Your Movement challenge, which was really inspired by this show. So we had the Leisure Movement Challenge going on. So we were doing actually two videos a day for 14 straight days. Um, and we wrapped that up on Monday, had a break yesterday, and we're back today with our weekly live show. And we are thrilled to be here. And we have a really cool topic today, something that uh, a lot of people don't talk about, um, an entire field of, of experts and organizations that are out there doing important work in this world uh, that we want to bring to light for all of you and just kind of expand your awareness about that, share what it's like in the trenches of doing that international development work, and also share some wisdom with all of you to help you as you lead your own movement. So that's what we're going to be doing today. A couple of announcements because we know we have a lot of new people in our community um, and a, not, a lot of new viewers of the show. So we do air every Wednesday live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then, of course, you can always catch this show in replay over on YouTube. So if you're not already subscribed to our channel there, I encourage you to do that. You can find us under my name, Angelique Rewers, uh, which is very easy because it's the only one out there. Okay. All right, so we are not going to waste any time today. We are going to get right in uh, to the topic and to our an amazing guest um, today who's been um, a client of mine, and I've, I've been a client of her hers, I guess you could say. It's it's worked in uh, in different directions um, that we have worked together in some really interesting ways over the years. And I'll have to tell you, she's one of the most fascinating people on the planet that I know. Um, and the work that she's done all over the world, every time I talk to her, she's up to something new. But it is always with a world-changing uh, mission behind her. And you're going to learn so very much today. Um, and I hope that you bring your your questions uh, and your comments to the show. Um, we're definitely going to have a chance to say, take some questions today, which is going to be amazing. So my guest today is the one and only Dr. Donna Vincent Roa, who leads USAID's new partnerships initiative incubator, which is a project of the Kaizen Company for whom for which Donna works, a global service hub set up to expand USAID's capacity for partnerships, diversify and strengthen its partner base, and help partner organizations to work with USAID. An author of four books and a multi potential light, Dr. Donna is a champion for innovation and international development and doing development differently. Please help me welcome to the show today, you guys, Dr. Donna Vincent Rowa. It is so good to see you, Donna. Hello, and so glad to be here. Excited to share my story. Oh my gosh. I think about, I'm going to ask you in a second to share what your movement is, but when I think about your journey, I remember when we were in Las Vegas, I don't remember if you, if you remember this, but we were in Las Vegas. We were at this like uh, hotel way outside the city and we were getting ready to go out for an evening of like bowling and, and all sorts of craziness as a group, as a group of uh, business owners. And you came up to me and you said, Angelique, you are not going to believe uh, what has happened, but I have this incredible opportunity and it's going to start a whole new chapter in my life. And it was just amazing. So we're going to get into some of that today. Uh, before we do, what is the movement you are leading? Absolutely. I'm excited to share that with you. I am a key player in driving innovation in international development. I've been put in a position to be an influencer within the context of a U.S. government agency. And back in October, I took the lead position, the project director position of the new Partnerships Initiative Incubator, where we had an opportunity to work hand in hand with USAID officials looking at the way that they do business. They conducted an extensive amount of research to get an understanding about the kinds of things that happen inside of the agency as it relates to working with partners. And through this research, I think over 250 people were interviewed to gather information about the pain points, the challenges, the issues. With this particular document came the development of the Partnerships Incubator. 
And we're like a service provider within the context of the agency serving missions across the world. There are about 100 of them, USAID missions, and also USAID headquarters. And then ultimately working with partners, small businesses, NGOs, faith-based organizations, in looking at the kinds of organizational capacity issues that they might address that would improve the way that they're able to work with USAID and their readiness to accept funds from the agency. So that, first of all, that's incredible. And, you know, I think I talk to a lot of people, I'll, I'll sometimes mention Donna, some of the work that Phil and I were so blessed to have an opportunity to do with USAID through your organization, the Kaizen Company, and through work with you. And when I sometimes mention it, folks are not that familiar sometimes with USAID um, and the incredible work that that agency does around the world in the space of international development. Now, obviously, you're here in your capacity. You're here in your capacity with the Kaizen Company and, and your role on that program. But just from from a, from a Wikipedia perspective, just from a baseline perspective, can you just explain to everyone what we mean by international development and the types of things that USAID does in the world? Because a lot of folks just are not familiar with that agency. Sure. So the agency provides funding to be able to improve various aspects or to provide development on various aspects in given countries. It could be on public health. It could be on democracy or economic development or water. In my career, I've had the rare opportunity to work on several USAID projects. And I'll give you the answer within the context of the firms or the projects that I've worked with that have been funded by USAID. I worked in global health before at the BASICS project, and that stands for Basic Support for Institutionalizing Child Survival. So this particular project worked on maternal and child issues throughout the world. Everything from the status of local or regional or hospital health settings to everything from behavior change as it relates to washing hands or behavior change as it relates to breastfeeding children. I had the opportunity to evaluate and work on the communication function. Projects that I work on that might be of interest is I traveled to Russia to do an examination or an analysis of the kinds of health messages that they used as it relates to vaccinations. I also had an opportunity to examine health mes messages overall for the government. And I traveled to Kazakhstan to do um, oh no, that was that was the State Department. That was also an interesting project, by the way. Um, I was one of the researchers that worked on the early research for the redesign of the $100 bill. Oh my uh, God. Anyway, but that's not about USAID. Let me get back to USAID. Um, the second one that I worked on was the Quality Assurance Project. And that particular project looked specifically at quality assurance within the context of local health centers, regional health centers and hospitals. We were responsible for putting together all of the training documentation. For example, um, this USAID funded project uh, allowed us to work with WHO in putting together the first CD-ROM based training on tuberculosis. We also worked on a uh, training module for quality assurance another CD-ROM development. So we looked at how to make training available as it relates to these health settings, but with the quality assurance overlay. And then we worked on several other, uh, let's see, the World Health Organization Child, in, let's see, Integrated Management of Childhood Illness. And we were able to work with them. This was the early integration of the integrated management of childhood illness and we worked on the training materials to be able to do that and then currently i work on the incubator but just before that i worked in a grand challenge which was a call for innovations in the area of water and agriculture the title of the project was securing water for food technical assistance facility and we had the luxury of working with small businesses a total of 40 of them throughout the world that focused on using technologies to improve how water is being used, how much water is being used for agriculture, 
Some of them worked on new kinds of seeds or seed coatings. And we had a chance to work with those businesses specifically to help them improve as businesses. So we had 21 service categories and were able to provide partnership training, for example. We also did organizational development, material science, public relations, branding, and, and many more. So these are just some of the flavors of the activities that I was involved in, but USAID as an agency uses taxpayer money to put these kinds of programs in place to improve a country's journey to self-reliance. And my current project falls exactly in that lane. That's incredible. I'm smiling, of course, for the Securing Water for Food. That was a program that Phil and I had the tremendous honor uh, to play a very small role and to meet some of those 40 innovators that you're talking about. And um, I, I have to say, there are certain moments from my journey, Donna, as I'm sure there are from yours over the years, that, that really stand out in your mind, you know, more than others. And uh, we were all in Amsterdam together and it was co it coincided with World Water Week. I'm sure you remember that conference. And several of your innovators were there and they were presenting to the room uh, what their, their innovations were, what their technologies were. And you know, Phil and I were pretty new to this space. Uh, you know, we kind of came into it through you and we were sitting there in the room and you know, you had explained all of this to us very well, very thoroughly. There's nothing though, like seeing it with your own eyes, right? And so we were sitting in the conference room in Amsterdam, listening to these innovators get up and show the technologies. And some of them were very basic technologies, like you said, seeds or, or coatings for seeds to be planted. And I had never been, I, I really can't think of many other times in my life, Donna, that I had been that moved um, by the work that people are doing in the world and to just see it up close. It was really, I mean, just for the audience's benefit, you know, you're talking about farmers in parts of the world who struggle to have enough water to grow their crops for their family or for their village. And these are, are people with, I mean, some of them, Donna, I would say uh, in that program were, were companies as small as two people. I mean, these were not like big companies here, right? And they were out there developing technologies that were literally saving lives changing lives, changing entire villages of how they would go about farming and having enough food. It was absolutely one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen. And I'm sure you have many days like that through the work you do. Yeah. I think people often ask me, why do you work in international development? Because as you know, we can take our, our suitcase of skills and go work for a tobacco company or go work for Rolls Royce or go work for an agency or just about any organization because I think within our context, we have a lot of transferable skills. Why do I choose international development? And I would say that emotional intelligence is something I rank high on. And for me to be able to connect my profession to something that influences my heart is the greatest gift I can give to myself. And you're right, over and over again, I can give you stories. Just as you were talking, there were two stories that came to mind that I will hold forever dear. And I'm still in touch with the innovator in Bangladesh who was driving down the riverbank and he watched all the sand as he drove by thinking to himself, we need to do something with that unclaimed land because in Bangladesh, seven months out of the year, the water recedes yep. and then it floods again with the rain. And so this back and forth movement suggests that there's a period of time where there's land, albeit mostly sand, available. And so what did he do? He created something called pumpkin farming Yep. and put together a business model that allowed this one village starting off to plant pumpkins, like multiple fields of pumpkins, miles and miles of pumpkins that so much influenced the food security of the region. It influenced the finance of individual uh, families where they could buy a motorcycle for transport. They could buy a cow. They now could put a roof on their, on their house. Um, these kind of things 
represent that direct connection where I do something and it has a benefit. I can see who it benefits. I can be very data oriented, by the way. We want to track what kind of influence we have by putting in place those metrics to showcase these kinds of achievements. But this was one of the most amazing stories that I have put my hands in. And I just want to say how open these very young businesses and startups are to ideas. And one day I was having a conversation with Nazmal, who I'm still friends with today. I said, do you know, in the US, um, they say that marigolds help with insect and rodent uh, prevention on the edges of gardens. So perhaps you can plant marigolds on your sandbars. Wow. So about two months later, he came to me and he said, Donna, I ran with your idea. It helps with the pest and the rodents. And two, the ladies of the village got so excited because they could pull some of the flowers and make lays that they could sell in the market, thereby increasing their income. And so you might say, well, gosh, that's a very simple idea. But when you have this human connection, when you have these conversations with people who are at the helm of influencing development, and you can suggest innovations here and there, and they take you up on it, and you see the fruits of the labor, I mean, what more could one ask for? And the second story I would share with you, Angelique, is I went to Cambodia and got a chance to see how technology was being used for farmers. And I traveled to the middle of nowhere in, in beautiful mountainous rains in these massive farms that were mostly run by women. And I went on this farm where the bounty, or the moment we stepped on this farm, I could just feel and sense the bounty that was here. I saw bell peppers, I saw cayenne peppers, I saw all these different plants. I saw fruits and vegetables. And I met the farmer and the husband and the daughter. And as I stood there in my work for that particular trip, I was responsible for photography. And so I was quiet, I was listening, I was trying to capture the essence of the moment. And this woman, the mother of the farm, was so proud and so regal and just like her aura captivated me. And I was able to take pictures of this person and you could tell that she was, she was sharing with me her pride of who she was, her pride of her land, the pride of the farm, the pride of the output. And you know, even to this day, as I tell this story, I even raise the hair on my own arms because I remember as I was taking photographs of this woman, I felt that, that peace and that calmness that my field has given me so much. It's given me a chance to connect with others who are influencing the lives of many. And as I walked away from meeting this family, and in particular this woman, I had tears streaming down my face thinking, I have been honored to be in the presence of this woman who is quite poor in the scheme of things, but quite rich in her universe as the queen of this, this existence. And her being was so impactful and influential to me that I walked away with tears in my eyes thinking, I am influenced in a deep and personal way by the work that I can get involved in. And so I'm happy to this day to say that I still am a champion for international development. I still am a champion for driving innovation within this context. And I've had the honor and the opportunity to carry my field within this context because it brings my heart great pleasure and just great satisfaction that one I know seeks to find in any kind of employment situation that they're in. Yeah, I I like I can just I feel your passion about that. You know, I it's funny. I knew you were going to talk about the pump. I, I just I had a feeling you were going to talk about the the pumpkin farming 
that left a huge impression on me as well. I think two of the other stories that I, I just want to share with everyone, um, especially because we're all up against challenges this year. You know, we can't maybe move around as freely as as we uh, as we could, or things that we used to rely on, we can't. You know, go that route currently. Um, I remember just in the interactions with some of these folks, just their their ingenuity, not just their, that they're innovative, but their ingenuity and their resilience. Uh, one of the folks that we worked with in, in Amsterdam, their company had developed these seed packets. And I'm sure you remember, Donna, they put the seeds in these packets and then they had sort of this color strip at the top and you buried the seeds in the ground to exactly where the color strip was. So you knew the exact depth and it was designed to help folks farm better who maybe didn't have formal education on how to farm certain types of crops. Um, but there was some resistance uh, as they passed out these seed, these seeding strips and the adults weren't using them. And so one of the innovators, when she was sharing the story about it, she said that what they ended up doing is going to the schools and they went to the schools in the villages and they taught the kids how to plant with these yeah. seeds. And they started the gardens first at the schools. And then once those gardens were so successful and the kids were showing their parents, it changed the parents' minds about using this new, you know, this new technology because the kids were growing this beautiful crop at the school. And that just, you know, reminded me like for me, that lesson was all about, first of all, what we can learn from, you know, what, what we, we really can learn uh, as people are overcoming challenges in other company, countries, but just sometimes to be willing to go in a different door if the first door you try is locked, you know, do you switch to a different door? And that stood out to me. And then the other story in terms of resilience that stood out to me, and I, you probably remember their name. I, I honestly don't remember their name. But they got up and they talked about how the only way that they could share their technology was literally they were in Nepal and they had to have um, it was it was like they, it was either a donkey or a or a yak it was some and, and they literally had a satellite phone a backpack and their donkey and they went door to door from village to village door to door on a donkey with a backpack and a satellite phone in order to try to change the lives of these folks with their innovation and i just um i just when i thought about Frankly, Donna, when I thought about some of the complaints that people make over the silliest little things, and here these are, you know, these innovators out there doing everything they can. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about the space that you're in when it comes to international development is there's tremendous resourcefulness, innovation, resilience, and ingenuity. Is that a fair, like, would you say that's a fair statement? Absolutely. You know, each time that you bring up one of these examples, I think about the 40 innovators that I work with. And I got a chance to go to Kathmandu in Nepal and then also surrounding areas to visit farms. And I had a chance to visit a fish farm and it was a fish farm by the river. And if you can imagine these, these very large fish ponds and then the river is kind of down the, down the hill because it's mountainous and the fish farm was about to go under because it didn't have access to water, which you think, you know, it's like down the ravine. And so one of our innovators was able to connect with this fish farm and provide the, the pump that's run by the force of the river. So you essentially put the technology in the river that's, you know, flowing by and it turns the pump and then it pumps the water up the hill into the fish ponds. And so this particular non-mechanical uh, technology actually saved this really beautiful fish farm at the bottom of a mountain near Kathmandu in Nepal. And I got a chance while I was there to eat some of the fish from the fish pond. And it was amazing. They literally caught it while we were there. It just came out of the water and they cooked it for us. And this family provided us with this opportunity to go into their household. And again, 
you felt the pride of the moment. This particular technology saved the livelihood, not only of this family, but of the region because of the way that they're able to provide fish to the community. And so seeing this was so beneficial. And I remember just looking at the place that they were living, the bed is also the table. Um, the bed is, is essentially a, a wood platform with a blanket on top of it. And, you know, you look at the human emotion, no matter what your state of life is, the human emotion of pride, of happiness, of giving, of being able to share your life with others. And I remember it was so hot and you could see just the sweat rolling off my face. And they suggested that I go to the hand pump and pour the water on myself. And it was just so delightful. I have put pictures to prove it, but I went to the water pump and literally just poured water all over myself and just felt again, so delighted that these people invited me into their lives. They shared their story with me. Of course, I was also taking pictures during this time frame, but I got a chance to see a farm that was saved, that influenced the economic security of the family and the food security of the village that they were serving. So it was amazing. And this was part of, again, a USAID funded project. And that, you know, if I could encapsulate, sort of summary, summarize all of the different things that I've talked about, USAID is invested in product uh, projects that help to make the world safer, healthier, and thirdly, more prosperous for the people that we're serving. And it's such an honor to be at the apex of that particular mission and work with an agency where that passion and connection to the kinds of things that you can do is evident across the board. I just, I, I, I've, you know me, every time that you and I have a conversation, you share with me the work that, that you all are doing at Kaizen Company as a partner, as a, as a, support, you know, a vendor in a technical, but really a partner in spirit uh, to USAID. I'm always blown away um, by that work. And um, the role that you play in this is, is an important one. Um, you know, what is it like to, <laughs> again, to try to lead some of these projects and some of these offices and, and, and initiatives because you know, you're dealing with, I mean, my goodness, with the pandemic, you're obviously not traveling like you once were for a, you know, a short amount of time here. We're all gonna look back and uh, be happy to see this in our rear view mirror. So right now you're not doing as much travel, but you're talking about communicating and collaborating with people in every single nook of the world, every time zone, every communication challenge, language barriers, technology barriers. Um, I mean, there were times that we were supporting some of the work you guys were doing and we couldn't even talk to the innovators um, or that you know we were supporting for a week or two until they got back into you know a place where there was any type of connectivity again. Right. What was it like to try to lead these kinds of programs given some of these challenges that we just mentioned? Sure. Well, let me give you some context first. So I am an employee of the Kaizen Company. The Kaizen Company wins projects from USAID, primarily USAID in the State Department. And so I am the project director of a major project. It's a $14 million incubator hub that was won by the Kaizen Company. So we're a contractor and I'm leading this project called the Partnerships Incubator. Now, I am connecting to what I said earlier about passion for international development. And I've been very blessed in being able to work with Kaizen because Kaizen is a social enterprise and they focus on the things in international development that I'm connected to and all the stories I just described to you. So they work on innovation and entrepreneurship within the context of international development and they focus on the locally led kinds of activities mm. and so you can see where my desire of working in international development is connected to a company who they, i mean we call ourselves advocates for locally driven development and then we are focused on all of this within the context of innovation and so I look at this from the perspective of 
an organization with a culture and mission that's connected to international development and focuses on the things that, that bring me passion. So looking specifically at how do you do it when you're connected to different places in the world? Well, let's say very simply the time zone. So sometimes I'll have meetings at 10 o'clock at night to be early meetings for people in Bangladesh, for example. And so there's the time zone. And then the technology, uh, we had a meeting this week, for example, with a firm in Ghana that we're working on. Uh, they're in the ag field and the meeting was supposed to be held at a specific time. Well, the internet was messing up on his end. And during the call, he dropped off about five times, but we stay there we're ready for him to come back on and we continue the conversation. And so there's the technology. So time, technology, and then sometimes communication. Obviously, if it's different accents, one has to be very patient in listening and understanding and also being ready to explain yourself. Obviously, it's a communication setting where you have to be sensitive to all of the nuances. And so your behavior in those kind of settings means that you have to come to the table with a large degree of patience because you're positioned as a coach. And obviously, listening is going to be a key skill to be able to bring to the table. And then oftentimes, you know, I use the term coachability. That for me is a critical part of the equation. In looking at when you work with some someone through the corporate agent, for example, if, if they don't really take to heart or listen to the kinds of things that you're recommending and you know them to be true, but they're not grabbing onto it because perhaps they think, you know, another direction's better, I would say that they might, might not be scoring so high on the coachability score. And that what I've come to learn is if someone is highly coachable, we can deliver and help them to yield the greatest results. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. That is the truth. And all of those things, you I mean, obviously, all of those things that you're talking about, I, you know, for me, when I'm listening, people sometimes get frustrated if there's just a little bit of interference in a Zoom session or a little bit of interference in, say, a Facebook Live or something. And I think that word patience. And I was, I'm always very struck by both your team, the team at USAID, and then your international partners that you all are, that you all work with in just this sort of really connection to higher purpose so that all of those little inconveniences about time and language and accents and technology and all of those pieces really don't even matter because the mission is so much bigger than that, that you all have tremendous patience to work through it because you're really clear on the purpose and why you're here and why you all are doing what you're doing. Um, I love, uh, um, I love one of the questions, Donna, that came in. I've got to ask you this. One of the folks watching said, what about people that think they're highly coachable, but they're anything but <laughs> highly coachable? So I've got, to ask, I've got to ask you that question because I know that you've certainly had challenges over the years. We've had some conversations. Um, so I know you've encountered this personally because we've had some wine and talked about it. Yes. So what are your thoughts about that when you when you have encountered folks, especially because sometimes there's cultural differences as well? What are some of the things you do to help folks who aren't as coachable as maybe they think they are? Um, you're, you're very diplomatic, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, we are change agents. And being a change agent comes with some pain. Now, we all seek ideal circumstances where we like the people we're working with. They, in fact, are coachable. It's like I use a ping pong game as, as the example. So when you play ping pong, there has to be a rhythm. There has to be a sometimes aggressiveness, but there's fun involved. And I would say that in a coaching setting, it should be like a fairly aggressive ping pong game. You want people to be fair but you want them to play. You don't want them to sit on the sideline and you just keep hitting the ball in one direction. And so what I would tell you is, 
I always go in to change management circumstances with the idea that it will bring delight. The variable is when the delight happens. Mm -hmm. In one example, I worked on a project for 12 months. And if you look at change management models, there is a category of audience called detractors. And I was able to ride the waves with champions, those who connected to the project, but the detractors, one in particular, took me 12 months to convince that the program was something that was important for the organization. But once it happened, the email that I received brought me so much delight that it helped me to, again, appreciate that I can be a change agent, one. Two, that being a change agent sometimes comes with some degree of pain. And three, I can never dismiss the delight that comes from when a detractor flips and becomes a champion. And I know what you're talking about there. And I'm like, oh, I wish I could share all of it, but I, I won't. But I, you know, I think too, part of this, Donna, is that you are a, you actually are a very purposeful individual and you are very aware of communication. Um, you know, your communication style and the way that you structure communications, program communications, field office communications, uh, you are a very, um, conscientious communicator. And I think that that goes a long way too, of always sort of being very purposeful when you enter meetings, because I've been in lots of meetings with you, of really reminding everyone why they're there and what the mission is and really sticking to that, I don't want to say script, but bringing people back to that message again and again and again. And um, I've watched it. I've watched it in progress. You're a very strategic communicator. I wish that more people would appreciate the value of becoming a solid communicator for change management purposes. Um, because, you know, that's really what we're all dealing with whenever we're working with our clients. Even if you don't think you're a change agent or a change management expert, if you're working with clients, you're a change management person, right? So that's, let me ask you about this. You use an interesting word in your bio. Um, and I'm really curious to learn more about this. So you've written a lot of books. You're the type of person that I, I still, I don't believe you actually do sleep ever. Um, I, I mean, first of all, you take calls 24 hours a day because you're working with people around the globe. You travel all over the world. You disappear for months at a time on these big global trips. Meanwhile, you've written like, I don't know, four plus books. Um, you're running multiple programs, a team of people. Um, and yet you still have all of this, this time going on. But you mentioned in your bio that you're a multi-potential light. Can you say more about that? Ter I love when I come across new terms. You know me, I'm a, wor I'm a wordy. So talk to me about this idea of a multi-potential light. Yeah, you know, when I first learned of that term, I can tell you that I had a major aha moment because I'm often asked the question, what don't you do? Right. That right. sounds about right, Donna. That sounds about right. I usually come back with the uh, a very quick answer, and that's macrame. Mm. Um, I've done it before, but you know. <laughs> See, you've uh, already done it. See, you've, you have done it. Only done it once, yes. So I guess not on the long term. But um, let's see. How do I answer that? Multi-potentialite, again, was an aha moment when I read about it because it helped me to understand my interest in diverse topics mm. and to not be afraid of it, not be, not, not hesitate to say that I am that, to revel in it, to use it as a label because it gives me permission to do whatever. Now you brought up my books. And so this is a perfect example. And I think about a bee, a bee. If you want to have outstanding uh, honey, a bee has to travel to many flowers and the final product is beautiful. It's tasty, but the work to get there took variety. And so I would say 
that's the closest concept I can apply to multi-potentialite. My books, the only thing common about it is I wrote it and my name is on there. <laughs> <laughs> but the first one was about funeral planning. Go figure. I couldn't find no kidding. I couldn't find a to-do list on the internet and my mom died and I didn't know what I was doing. And so I kept this little notebook and then looked at it at the end of all of it. And I thought, well, somebody else needs this. Why don't I write a book? Well, I'd never written a book before, but I thought, okay, I'll learn how to do it. And it's an idea that the universe gave to me. This is where serendipity and magic comes in and that we have to honor what shows up and that showed up. So I took a year, I wrote a book and I thought, oh, I can do this again. So I decided to write a book about, uh, let's see, a gap in the marketplace called The Value of Water, a compendium of essays by smart CEOs. I wanted to put in place the voice of CEOs as it relates to the value of water. And I put together a proposal. I pitched it to five organizations and one said yes. And I was able to produce this awesome book about water. The next one's on propaganda and public diplomacy. I did this research when I was in my doctorate. And then the last one, is a book that's based on a film script that I wrote. The original title was One Child, and the log line was in the quest to find her Chinese birth parents. An abandoned girl learns the bizarre fact that her father is the author of China's one child policy. So I took that script, rewrote it, and created a book called Five Knocks. All four books are on Amazon. And this Thursday and Friday, I'm taking off of work to write on my next two books. Oh my goodness gracious. See, that's what I'm talking about, you guys. It's like, how does Donna sleep? Um, if I I need to play this segment for Phil, Donna, because every time I talk to Phil, I have a different book idea. And Phil's like, are you ever going to write any of them? Because every time you turn around, you have a different book idea. And I never write any of them because I'm always jumping on to the next book idea. Maybe the, maybe the problem isn't that I need to decide which one to write. Maybe is the pro I should just write all of them. That's right. Um, I could I could take a page out of your book. That's ridiculous. All right. So let's talk about another philosophy. So I feel like one philosophy you have is that when you have an idea, it's to bring it out into the world. And I've watched you do this for years. Um, even when you went with to to work with the Kaizen Company and do this work with with uh, USAID, you know, you were headed in one direction, and this amazing opportunity came to you so you could impact people around the world. I, I watch you do this all the time. One of your favorite terms that you say all the time is zigzag. Um, and you're always talking to people about the importance of zigzagging. Can you, can you share a little bit about that as some words of wisdom for everyone? I believe that all of us are provided with opportunities that show up on our doorstep. And it's what we do with those opportunities that are critically important. I was watching Facebook one day and I saw a notice for a class, but it said you had to be under 40. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll lie. No, I won't lie. Maybe I'll lie. And so I actually wrote this on the comments and mm -hmm. someone wrote me back and said, no, you have to take this course on technology commercialization. In my mind, I'm thinking, what do I know about that? However, it showed up. So I took this 12 month course and it was during that time that I created the proposal for my book. I also gave presentations every single week and got a chance to meet a speaker who, guess what, happened to be three years later, the person that Kaizen calls out of the blue to say, do you know of anybody that can run this major project? And he goes, yeah, he goes, I met this woman in a, in a, a technology class and she was passionate about water. She knew her stuff. She was a great speaker. I mean, and on and on. So Kaizen calls me up out of the blue and says, hey, we think we have a job for you. And so part of the answer to this in zigzagging is things will show up in your life and they'll show up in your life. They won't show up in my life. We have to honor what shows up. I used to say what bubbles up because part of it is, you know, our connection to the universe. And so we need to take action on those. And this was the perfect example where every week I was passionate about my technologies. I gave really awesome presentations because I love doing it. And it's one of my strengths. And I was able to move the mind of someone who became a critical turning point or zigzag and allowed me to connect to this amazing company, the Kaizen company and the amazing work that we do. I'll also say that it's important for us to show up every time we have an opportunity opportunity because you never know what seed you're going to plant and how that's going to grow for your favor and cause you to zigzag in another direction. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, so many things I want to say about that. I, you know, you're someone who says yes. I think one of my, the, the, I have so much respect for you, Donna. And one of the reasons I have such great respect for you is because you're very well studied and I'm someone who values knowledge very much. Um, I read things just for the sake of reading them and becoming knowledgeable in them. You know, my, my family thinks I'm crazy because I read medical studies at night for fun and things of that nature. So, uh, but I, you're you're someone who's very well studied and you you take in a tremendous amount of information. But there's something else you do too, and I always have a lot of respect for people who say yes, yes to opportunities, yes to ideas that come up for them. Um, and and I've watched you do that, and I think why is that? Why do you think? that you have, like, do you think that you were born with the, that sort of interest of being curious and learning and saying yes to opportunities? Is it something that you feel like you, it's a, it, it's something you cultivate it in yourself over time? Like, where does, where do you think that comes from? I think we should also, or we should always be on our toes to listen and to watch what may show up. Mm. I was working for an agency at the time and I was, I think a change is necessary. And so I asked my husband to, to buy me books on screenwriting. He bought me seven books on screenwriting in Christmas. And from January to February, I read those seven books. And then one thing I did was I set a goal. I put together 125 blank pages. I put in the brads that you would see in a normal script and I put it on my desk. And I used it. I would look on my desk every time I would go in and I used it as inspiration. My brain thought it was already done. So from February to May, I wrote a screenplay, 125 pages. And that's the one child. I told my husband, now I need to do something with it. Let me go to Hollywood and pitch it. And so I went and pitched it and ended up getting an option for my screenplay. We produced a short film. Oh, but wait, I came back home and told my husband, can we move to Hollywood? Now, I was a pretty high GS. 1510 worker in the government and my husband who is my partner in crime and 100 support that's the beauty of me being able to do things he said put together a plan so we moved to hollywood and i wrote screenplays and i acted in movies and i went on this adventure and i think in life we are giving up we are given opportunities for adventures and we have to be able to take risk and we have to say let me try this out. I don't know what it's going to yield. And I went in to give my notice. I gave my two weeks notice and they said, well, would you be willing to continue to work with us? Speaking of teleworking in 2007, would you be willing to work with us part time in your role as you write screenplays and act in movies? And of course I said, absolutely. With benefits? Yes. Oh my God. So I, adventures I, show up. Adventure. Well, and so... That's really the word. That's really the word. You are an adventurer. Um, you've inspired me a little bit in that you guys, last time I was in Washington, DC, uh, Donna and I met for lunch at an, a phenomenal Ethiopian restaurant. Do you remember that? Um, and Donna's also an artist, by the way. In my, in my room, I have this beautiful drawing um, that Donna did for me. It's quite gorgeous. And I probably should have taken it off the wall to show you guys. But anyway, I have this beautiful drawing from Donna. She's an artist. Apparently, she has done macrame. She's acted. She's written books. She's written screenplays. She's traveled pretty. How many countries have you been to in the world? Do you know? 47. 47 countries around the world. She's uh, helped folks in every, like every possible environment, you guys, without even, you know, cellular technology um, to be able to move their missions and their platforms forward. It's really just phenomenal. If you had to sum up your, your advice uh, for everyone, Donna, who, you know, you, I think you've been very clear uh, over the years in the movement that you're leading and, and this desire to really help international development uh, all over the world to really create economies that are self-sufficient and create uh, communities that have the resources that they really need. But if you were to, to step back from all of that and share your best piece of advice uh, for those who are really looking to take their adventure to the next level and to make a bigger dent in the world, because you've taken quite a sledgehammer to the world, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what would be your biggest piece of advice? Tell me how many minutes I have and I'll fit. 10. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I've got some really important pieces of advice. 
The one thing that I do want to mention is that we have an opportunity to um, take a look at our lives from the perspective of what do we do that makes us whole? And I would say I'm going to mention my involvement in Harbor City Music Company. I'm also a singer and I have the opportunity to sing with 125 women and we do everything from barbershop tunes to love songs to you name it. And last September we competed on, on the international stage and we ranked fourth in the Sweet Adeline's international system. So I would say don't underestimate the power and the importance of creativity in your life and the application of creative genius, and we all have it, to provide balance in your life, that we have to redirect who we are to do things that are artistic and creative. And that for me has been an amazing opportunity to connect to that side of me that's fun. If you go and you, you Google Harbor City Music uh, semifinals, New Orleans, I'm the one with the hat and I'm the MC of the show. And it's just a rare opportunity to give back your talents in another setting. And I think that's been a critical part of my success, whether it's book writing or screenwriting or uh, singing in, in uh, musicals or plays or chorus now, this is the, one of the most important activities, including singing in a quartet. So that's first and foremost, don't underestimate the power and importance of creativity and the application of your creative genius, which it is there into the other side of your life that's not work. If you're able to do that inside of work, wow, that's another bonus. Always have your eyes wide open because life and the universe will provide you with adventures and things will bubble up that will challenge you, that will scare you, that will make you feel like this might be a risky situation, but that those kind of things tap into the passion and the common threads in your life. If I'm an ambassador for water, guess what? An idea for a water book showed up and I honored the fact that it showed up. Within the context of how you show up, let me tell you that diversity and inclusion is something that drives my life. It drives my family, it drives my marriage, it drives my work, it drives my team, it drives how I operate and what I do, I would say that my life is enriched by others who are different than me. I become better when I am surrounded by diverse audiences and I am inclusive in my actions. Next is always remember that people are our greatest asset, our personal within the work setting and that for me, what is paramount that I treasure and is so much part of a culture that I want to lead or operate in is how we treat people, how we treat others is critical. I want to see it. I want my team members to treat each other right. I want to treat them right and be known for treating them right. I think we have to build people up and I am a champion for operating in strengths. If someone in an interview says, Donna, what are your weaknesses? Or, you know, in a job interview, they say, oh, well, tell me about your greatest weakness. I don't know. I don't focus on those. I can tell you what my strengths are, but frankly, I haven't thought about my weaknesses. My husband would probably say the only weakness I have is that I go on a lot of international trips and I take a long time to unpack. That <laughs> is probably my greatest weakness. Now, the sec the what fifth thing, I don't know what number I'm on, but I'm so excited about sharing this information. I love it. It's great. And Cassandra, I agree with you. This is absolutely inspiring. <laughs> that we all have to expect magic in our lives. I want you to entertain it. I want you to expect it. And I want you to notice it when it shows up. It's like, I know it's going to come to me. And I could give you story after story. How long is this, this podcast? We need about five hours where I could tell you stories that would blow your mind because I expect it, I want it, I entertain it, I'm excited about it, but I also take action on it. I honor what's been given to me. I use this example to many that it's like a magic carpet. We are responsible for the material. 
We are responsible for what kind of weave it's going to be, the color, etc. We are responsible for weaving it, putting it on the floor. If we stand in the other room and the carpet is in the, in the next room and not getting on it, we miss. However, if we put it together, we've planned it, it's good, it's high quality, and we step on it, hang on for the ride. And that's what I challenge everyone to do is you got to do the work but you got to expect the magic. And once you step on that magic carpet, the universe transpires to bring us the greatest and deepest wishes of our heart. The year that I got the job with Kaizen, I wrote down five things that I wanted my year to bring. I wanted to work in water. I wanted to lead an amazing team. I wanted to work in a green building. I wanted to work with a company that shared my values. Guess what showed up? the Kaizen company. Guess what job I got in water. And I work in a, I worked in a green building when we were in a space. So write down what you want, allow the universe to get into the deepest wishes of your heart and go forward. Hashtag results. Don't forget that work ethic, attitude, and peace on all levels. And finally, we must all invest in women and in the younger generation. Ah, oh, yes. Oh my gosh. So you guys, can you see why I love Donna? Can you understand why I want to go fly to DC just to see Donna and go have lunch with Donna? Sorry, <laughs> this, is why, this is why I absolutely, this idea, you know, you gave me chills when you said expect magic. You know, I know that. And I think this year I forgot that. And I thank you for reminding me that, um, that we do need to be expectant, um, to, to have that sort of expectant energy for the magic and to take the action, um, but also know that that magic is always going to show up. You and I have both shared so many stories, Donna, of things that there were no, like, not in... If we tried our hardest, we could not have aligned the things to have happened if we like tried to plan it. Never the fact that you signed up for that class, that you weren't even supposed to be in that class. And then because of that class, someone else came and talked to Kaizen and the exact opportunity. And then you were, by the way, you were with us in Las Vegas when you got that phone call, if you remember, yep. and just like that space for all of that to happen. It's just, it's, it's, it is magic. That's what it really is, is, is magic and us allowing that space. This has been absolutely amazing. I know people are going to want to connect with you. Um, is, what is the best way? Is the best way on LinkedIn? What works for you? Yeah, I'm fully on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with people and, you know, just uh, reach out to me. I'm there. Let's connect. Oh my gosh. And what is, can you share Kaizen's website for those who just want to learn a little bit more about the Kaizen company? Because you all really are doing unbelievable world-changing work through that organization. Yeah, it's, um, it's the Kaizen company and we're on the web, uh, the kaizencompany.com. And you can get an idea of the kind of things that we're doing from that website, including uh, projects and our careers. So yeah, take a look at it. It's been um, an amazing journey for me to be connected to the Kaizen company. And I would tell you, there's actually an article on my LinkedIn called the freedom to operate. And that is one of the most beautiful aspects that, that I can talk about is they've given me the freedom to operate, to achieve results, to connect to this great work that I'm doing. And they offer advice and support just at any time that it's needed. So I'm happy to be in this space and very proud to be working for the Kaizen Company in international development. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Donna, for the work that you do. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, because the work that you do, you gave me the opportunity, um, the way that the threads connected in the world to do some of the most meaningful work that I've ever had an opportunity to do because you did expect the magic and because you did step in into everything that you're doing. You created opportunities for so many others. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here on our show with us today. Um, I'm so thankful. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Take care. Um.
Amazing. Oh my gosh, you guys. Donna is absolutely amazing. You can see why um, I just had to have her on the show and talk about some of that international development work that she's doing through her role with the Kaizen Company and, and them being a contractor to USAID. Um, just the, her world travel, the people that she's connecting with, um, how dynamic and interesting uh, she is and uh, how wise she really is um, in terms of how we need to show up on this great adventure that we're all on. I could talk to her all day. And in fact, we have. We have been at, at like five hour lunches before um, and just have had the most interesting conversations. So very blessed. I feel very blessed to have her uh, as someone in my life. And uh, I wish her and, and, and the team at Kaizen uh, the very best with some of the work they're doing with USAID. Let me tell you, coming out of this pandemic globally, uh, those initiatives that are being run out of USAID are going to be more important than ever uh, to developing economies all across the planet. And that work is, is tremendous. And while, uh, you know, there's various, you know, government agencies out there and, and how sometimes we can feel about government. I've thanks to Donna and some of the work we had a chance to do through her. I've had a chance to, to meet and actually work with people at USAID. And if you want to talk about people who approach every day with just their heartfelt mission, uh, it's really incredible what's going on at that agency. So thank you guys so very much for being here today. Uh, just a note, we will be back next Wednesday again, live at 1 PM Eastern. Um, and then the week after that, we're all going to be at the Real Deal Conference for three days. Um, if you think any of this is valuable, just wait until you're with us for those three days at that conference and what we're going to be talking about this year, what we're going to be training on, and the amazing speakers that we have coming in uh, to The Real Deal from the Association for Talent Development, UPS, Accenture, Kaiser Permanente, ADP, UPS, um, two CEOs of fast-growing businesses that are completely changing uh, company cultures and the way organizations operate, um, not to mention our faculty here at The Corporate Agent and the content that I'll be delivering as well. So if you don't already have a registration uh, for The Real Deal, I highly recommend you get it. It's going to be uh, the most rewarding and impactful three days that you spend on your business this year. And I say that uh, hands down, bar none, unapologetically, it's going to be amazing. Um, and I really don't want you to miss it. Until next week, everyone, this is Angelique signing off. Have a great day, everybody.